to Bethany Lutheran in Warren, Oregon. Today I'm preaching on the Psalm of the Day, which is Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for me be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. For they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Daniel Webster, former congressman, senator, and secretary of state, was dining with several authors in Boston. A preacher who had written many books was sitting across from Webster and said, Mr. Webster, can you comprehend how Jesus Christ can be both God and man? Mr. Webster, with one of those looks that no man can imitate, fixed his eyes on him and said, No, sir, I cannot comprehend it. If I could comprehend it, I would be greater than he and I need a superhuman savior. Last Sunday, I spoke of Jesus as a superhero. Today in Psalm 25, we see David, like Daniel Webster, in need of a superhuman savior. David wrote Psalm 25 with such realism. It, like our piety, resembles a teeter-totter. My God, in you I trust. Please do not let me be humiliated. Guide me into your truth. Do not hold the sins of my youth against me. The psalmist places him before the throne of God while also admitting his loneliness and grief. There's praise and lament. There's piety and pity. Regarding his faith walk, David is writing of strong seasons and weak seasons. And who cannot relate to that? This psalm is written as an acrostic poem. The first word of each successive verse is the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The first seven verses are a prayer for help. We are not told who or what the enemy is, but as we read the psalm, we understand the problem. David is working through how to pray after you have sinned. We can all relate to the little child who walks with their head hung low and hands behind their back, kind of shuffling their feet, coming to mommy or daddy to confess a broken rule. Now imagine coming before Yehovah, God Almighty, to confess that broken rule, that sin. Is there anyone who cannot relate to this scene? Anyone who has not lived this moment? I have many times. And so did King David. He sinned. He breached the awesome relationship he had with God. Well, now what? How can he enter the presence of God again? How can he repair this rift in their relationship? How can God love him again? Well, the first thing to do after you have sinned is to pray to the Lord. Do not try to hide. You can't. 
You can't run far enough east nor west to escape God's eye. Adam and Eve tried that. After they sinned, they hid among the trees of the garden. It did not work. God called them out. Noah jumped on a ship to flee God, and we all know how that turned out. Instead, David calls upon God. Verse 1, O Lord, I come before you in prayer. Come to God in prayer. Let your soiled soul be lifted to the Lord. It's not always easy to bring guilt before the Creator. You may feel unworthy. That's okay, because you are unworthy. It is because you're unworthy that you need to turn to God. God wants you to return to him. He's waiting for you to ask for the relationship to be repaired and restored. After you have sinned, tell God that even though you strayed, you do trust him. You still have confidence that he will hear your plea and will free you from the shame that accompanies sin. Verse 2. My God, I trust in you. Please do not let me be humiliated. Do not let my enemies triumphantly rejoice over me. What David is referring to here is the public humiliation based on false trust. He does not want his enemies to mock him for trusting in a God who did nothing as expressed in Hosea 4 verse 8. They feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. Verse 3. Certainly none who rely on you will be humiliated. Those who deal in treachery will be thwarted and humiliated. We may need to feel some humiliation over our sinful deeds, but it does not end there. Wait on the Lord. For those who do will never be let down or ashamed for having done so. Here David is waiting on God for deliverance and help from the mess he made for himself. He's expressing confidence that those who are taking advantage of his situation will be shamed in the end. Verses 4 and 5. Make me understand your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths, guide me into your truth, and teach me. For you are the God who delivers me. On you I rely all day long. Jesus said, as recorded in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. David is praying for God to redirect him and guide him so he would go back to living God's way. We too need God daily to renew our minds and make right our course in life. One way God does this is through his living word. We must read our Bibles on a regular and continuous basis. For that is where we find God's truth. And not just read, but study. Seek the wisdom of those who have studied the scriptures diligently and live according to God's directions. Notice David asked for his enemies to be shamed by their actions against one of God's people. By, but then he moved on. If he had not, he could have become fixed on vengeance. But moving on, he's showing that he trusts God to handle it. It's more important for David and us to focus on restoring our relationship with God, for God is the one who delivers us. Here, David is not just talking about our eternal salvation. He's also seeking deliverance from his enemies. Verse 6. Remember your compassionate and faithful deeds, O Lord, for you have always acted in this manner. David is asking God to respond to his requests and pleas according to his covenantal love. 
God made covenants with his people, with you and me in our baptisms. And we want him to remember the love, mercy, and grace that he promised to us. David is asking for the same compassion that God showed repeatedly to those he claimed as his own. Verse 7, do not hold against me the sins of my youth or my rebellious acts. Because you are faithful to me, extend to me your favor, O Lord. Here we see David express a confidence that God will intervene on his behalf. We can hope for the Lord to answer our prayers, or we can wait for the Lord to answer our prayers. Do you see the difference? The latter shows confidence in God. We assume that God will hear us and answer. The answer will be in God's time, but it will come. And as John writes in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verses 8 and 9. The Lord is both kind and fair. That is why he teaches sinners the right way to live. May he show the humble what is right. May he teach the humble his way. David reminds himself that God's character is to be kind and fair. Because of this, he is confident that God will teach him how to move on from his failures. Too often, we feel guilty. We seek forgiveness, but we do not move on. Part of accepting forgiveness is repentance, which means to turn away. We need to turn away from sinful habits and choices that got us into this mess and choose to live in a God-led manner. However, we need God to teach us how to do so. We have so much knowledge at our fingertips. We can fix a broken heart and replace dead kidneys. We can travel through space and back. We can build technological components too small to be seen with the naked eye. But we cannot on our own accord instinctively know right from wrong. We think that if it feels right, it must be right wrong. Romans 3 verses 10 through 12. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Romans 1 verse 22, Paul says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Finally, we see David rejoice in the fact that God is so faithful and merciful to those who obey him. Verse 10, the Lord always proves faithful and reliable to those who follow the demands of his covenant. Exodus 34, 6 and 7 says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. God's steadfast love refers to that part of his character that gives man kindness he does not deserve. Verses 9 and 10 show us that God is just and upright in his transactions. He teaches us what sin is. He teaches us how to avoid sinning. And then when we still sin, God shows us how to be released from the control of sin. We can come to God in prayer at any time, in any circumstance. Know that when you feel the least worthy to call upon God or to be heard by God, know that then God is waiting for you with open arms. He will not fail you because his love for you is perfect. Amen.